Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Junkyard Digs. My name is Kevin and today we have a 1970 F100 pickup. This truck has not been on the road in 15 years and we're going to see if we can get it running and hopefully driving. Let's begin. So today you join us in the woods behind our house where we have placed this 1970 F100. I found this truck on Craigslist with a camper in the back, immediately fell in love with the patina, went and looked at it, decided the camper was a complete lost cause, bought the truck for $500, brought it home, and put it right here. As the story goes, the man we bought this truck from, this was his dad's truck he bought in 1977. After his dad passed, he inherited the truck and drove it all over the country with that camper in the back of it. About 15 years ago, he decided he was too old to continue doing that and let it sit in the driveway which is where it sat until the day we picked it up. I believe this truck is an inline six with a three on the tree. Absolute bare bones, basic F100. Should be a really good candidate for an easy revival. Let's make it happen. So I should probably preface this video with exactly what's going on here today. We are in the process of moving to a different house that's closer to the shop and more suited for content creation and storing cars and all sorts of other things. So with that being said, we are in a huge time crunch to get all the vehicles off the property, get the house listed up for sale, la di da di da And this thing needs to get finished and drive the hell out of here. So I'm gonna see if I can get this done in hopefully an afternoon, if not a day and a half, uh, get this thing fired up, drive in, and on the road towards the new property. Let's see if we can do it. All right, well, it's the next day, so that didn't happen. I was just about to get started on that when I realized both camera batteries were dead, so I stopped to charge those. And in the meantime, got a call from the sewer inspection company saying, hey, we're coming out this week to inspect your system. So uh, if you want to save 80 bucks an hour for digging, dig that cap up. And I said, done deal. I will do that. I grabbed my shovel and head over to where the last owner said the underground sewage system was and started digging and digging and digging and digging and digging and digging and digging. Moral of the story, call the previous owner who's done it before and ask what they did before you just assume, ah, it's a sewer system. It's gonna have a round access cap and keep digging until you find it. All I needed to dig was this little rectangle right here. So yeah, fun stuff. But uh, now we know what the entire tank looks like so I can tell the next guys, here's where to dig in three years. In the meantime, Mook painted the entire deck. So thank you, Mook. That looks amazing. Anyway, Let's go ahead and head back over to the truck and get that damn thing running. Maybe. Or dig more holes. I don't know. By the way, if anyone's curious, I have been dailying the Eagle since that video got finished. And I love it. It's awesome. For whatever reason, that car gets as much attention as that car. Which makes no sense. But everywhere I stop, someone's like, Wow, I haven't seen one of those four-wheel drive cars in a long time. Or, holy shit, an Eagle. So yeah, I guess Eagles are still cool. Alright, picking up where we left off before I went mining for poop. I don't think we've taken a look at this thing yet. I haven't really even taken a look at this thing yet. Sure enough, it's an inline 300. We've got manual dual reservoir brakes, which is good. I got an extra one of those sitting around. Uh, good old single barrel carb. Air cleaner's laying over there. Here's a blinker housing next to, uh, looks like a newer starter solenoid. Do we spin? Oh yeah, it spins beautifully. Some bitch is a little bit rusty, as you can see there. You can see into the cab through the cab mount, so <laughs> woofda. I'll be looking on slippery goo. Oh, it looks nice and fresh. It's even right in the right where it's supposed to be on the marker. There's our carburetor move. It do. That's good. That's good. Yeah, let's uh let's just jump right into this one. Now this truck is old enough to not have a DuraSpark system, so we do have a points distributor. Probably gonna have to sand those points, but I think we're pretty much ready to the point of grab a battery and see what works electrically, and see what we can do to bring this thing to life. Um, it was a blue truck, as you can tell, and the guy primered it at one point. Uh, it was actually under, as you saw in the picture, it was under a tarp when we got it. For whatever reason, the bed is really good, for all things considered. Um, so that's awesome. Oh, no gas cap. That'll probably be an issue, but we'll get to that when we get to that. It's a dash. Beautiful blue. The keys are in it. That's good. Uh, the seat's seen better days. Pretty much no floors left, but such is life. 
we have a clutch that moves. We do, and it feels good. The brake pedal, different story. It does not move at all. In here we have an Oldsmobile radio. Why is there an Oldsmobile radio? The ashtray got turned into a smash tray and shoved through the dash. Ooh, old house fuses, 30 amps. Those are pure glass too. Those are freaking old. They're not even the metal ring ones. On, like some had glass in the center, but they're metal around. We've got queen filter. There's a filtration for breathing in here. So this must be, and an O-ring. So this must be a filter cover for something. I don't know, let me know down in the comments. Does anyone recognize that? There's our headlight buckets. What are you? You must have gone... You must have gone here? This truck was such a base model, it didn't even come with a radio. It had this sweet radio delete plate I have never in my life seen. Check this out. It's got the... It's got the, the emblem in the floor mat. These are original, like, vinyl floors. This would be 107,000 miles. Wow. I bet that motor is shot, which is why it turns so easy. Either way, let's get a battery in this and see what comes to life. Alrighty. Time to get a battery in this thing. Oh, you know what this is? This is STP uh, additive. This is what we put in all our oil for zinc because camshafts back in the day need zinc and it's not in oil anymore because of catalytic converters. So yeah, that's good to see. And the other good news is, well, it's full. I don't know if that's actually good news, but it's good the fact that now I have half a bottle for free, but it might not be in the motor. These batteries have seen so much abuse, it looks like it was already in the truck when I started. Let's check headlights. Hey, we got headlights. Let's see if she cranks. Did I just pick a dead battery? I probably did. Damn it! Okay, well, that's probably a bad starter. That's not what I want. All right, begin with the eight starter adventure, Morty. God, why is it always on the days I'm so busy that they just fight me and fight me and fight me? Before I go all the way to pull this starter, let's do a little inspection. We wanna make sure that end down there is hooked up. We're gonna smack the top of that case right there. We're gonna make sure everything's tight. Oh, well. Believe it or not, that might be enough to do it right there. Let's uh, let's tighten this guy up. Ah, my battery lost continuity that time. Now I don't have power suddenly, which means we had a much higher amperage from a higher load. So that might have fixed it in a long roundabout way of saying that. Let's see if she spins now. Again. A lot of times it can be this too. So just make sure everything's nice and tight. And if you really care, take this all off and clean it, which I might have to do. So remember, before you go replacing your battery, always check that these are like clean and well contacted because cleaning this and making sure that this is properly charging and discharging into the starter is a lot cheaper than getting a new battery. Now sometimes, if you're sneaky enough, you can turn this clamp plate upside down to where it's not been corroded on the back side. Slip that wire that you just rubbed against itself to clean it up back in. And then tighten it down upside down and it'll work if you're in a bind. Okay. Let's see what that does. Nothing's happening. Why is nothing happening? <laughs> So if you don't have your voltmeter on you, what you can do is put a load on the circuit, like turn the headlights on, and wiggle stuff. And if you see any sparks or smoke or noise up here, or the headlights turn on as you're wiggling things, then you know that's what your problem is. And it looks like, oh, there's my headlights. It's this guy right here is actually what's, what's wrong. And yes, I can see he is broken. That would do that. That makes sense. All right, we'll do it again to this terminal, and then maybe we'll be good to go. Okay, so let's talk a little bit of electrical science real quick while I'm fixing this. Why does batteries do what it do when sometimes you hop in and you hit the key and you hear clunk and then you gotta go re-wiggle 
your uh, connection until it works. Why, why does that clunk? What is happening? Why is there a puff of smoke sometimes and then you lose power and you don't have enough voltage to like run or crank anything? So what's happening is you have a bad connection. A bad connection induces high resistance because the current and the voltage do not change. Well, the current can't, the current actually has to drop mathematically, but it uh, induces high resistance, which creates a lot of heat. That heat will burn whatever connection, what small connection you have. This all derives from the literal mathematic equation for voltage, resistance, and current. V equals IR. Voltage is current times resistance. Well, if your current is focused down to a little spot, your resistance is going to become a much larger value. Basically, things are going to get really hot really quick in a very small focused area. And that little piece of lead you had connecting to the other piece of lead, such as between this and the battery post, is going to get hot and go boom and literally burn and immediately char the surfaces between those until you come out and wiggle this again and find a new spot for it to create a new connection and carry enough current for the load. So if you have a battery that is sparking off of a terminal and you gotta wiggle it until it works, it's, no matter how clean it is, if it's still sparking and doing that, you don't have a good enough connection. So get a nail or a screw or something, and I like to take self-tappers or a screw or whatever and put them right in this gap and screw them in. Preferably one that is not coated like this. This doesn't really do you any good. One that is a bare metal nail screw or self-tapper so that this actually acts as a physical connection between these two. In this case, we straight up have a rusty wire and a broken terminal. So we don't really do a lot of electrical talk on the channel. I actually went to college initially as an electrical engineer. Found out I was uh, neither brilliant nor Asian and dropped out of electrical engineering into mechanical engineering, at which point I found out I was not that good at math, to where I transferred to industrial technology and graduated with an industrial technology degree out of Iowa State's AST program. Iowa State calls it industrial technology. The rest of the world calls it applied engineering, so it's, it is an engineering degree. They're just assholes over here. Which, by the way, if you're currently going to Iowa State for mechanical engineering or any other engineering degree, and you're like, this is not what I was told I was going to be doing. I walked through a building called Sukup and got to see all these guys playing with diesel engines and electrical panels and stuff. And all you do every day is math and computer simulations. That's because you got juked. They sell the iTech program to the mechanical engineering students. They walk you through our building and our curriculum and then give you the bait and switch and give you the really shitty curriculum in comparison. So if you're struggling at Iowa State or probably most colleges, in your mechanical or other uh, degree of engineering, check out Applied Engineering, or what Iowa State calls it, Industrial Technology. The iTech program is amazing. So yeah, there's your junkyard digs advice on life if you wanna have an engineering degree, but you don't give a shit about escape velocities because that has nothing to do with your career, Industrial Technology, or Applied Engineering. All right, I'm gonna go get a new battery terminal and we'll try this again. I didn't have any terminals here at the house, but I did have this one wire I found and I just kind of stuck it onto an alternator bolt. And I mean like hammering it on there with a the pliers. So I doubt that works. We'll see. All right, there it goes. Holy crap, that actually worked. That's literally all it takes. <laughs> I mean, obviously that's not gonna be a permanent solution and probably as soon as I rev the engine in any fashion, it torques over to make that not work again. But Hey, that's fine by me. Everywhere I go, I hear a damn Chinook. Where are you? There it is. I knew it. I knew that noise. Hello, old unit. Hope you're having fun. You know what? There is my other bit of life advice for you guys. Six years in the National Guard is pretty goddamn easy if you get into the right MOS. I was a Chinook mechanic for six years. I didn't pay a dime for my college. I went to college for five, five and a half years because of deployments. Do anticipate it's going to take you longer than everyone else, but you're gonna come out of college debt free. For the five years I was in school, I took every little extra bit of monthly stipend and VA bill and everything that I got paid that was more than what Iowa State was charging, and I put it into a savings account. When it came time to buy our next house, I had $46,000 sitting there ready to go for a down payment. And if you know anything about being an adult, that is huge to have that much extra sitting around for a down payment and B, to come out of college debt-free, going straight into the workforce. 
and starting off five years ahead of everyone else, even though it took you a year and a half longer to get through college because of the Army. If I had to do it again, I would join the Air Force though, because that would be way freaking easier. Uh, in fact, all my buddies that stayed in after deployment, I was smart and got out. Everyone else who stayed in joined the Air Force and they're like, this is a cakewalk. We get hotels instead of cots. Seriously consider joining the National Guard, the Air Guard, the Army Reserves. You will learn self-discipline, a working skill set, and so much more that our society is lacking today that it seriously needs. Plus, school's free and it's always a good backup career. And for those of you considering that right now, your MOS is going to be a big factor of how good of a time you have. A lot of people like to go in and do grunt stuff, so they go in and they go into the infantry, the Cav Scouts, or Forward Observer, or artillery, or combat engineer, all that crazy stuff that I want nothing to do with. If you like cars, you can go in and be a light-wheeled mechanic, but I'm going to repeat exactly what my cousin told me the day I was looking into going into the military. He said, would you rather continue to work on stuff and be covered in grease every day, just like you do right now, or would you rather work in a dentist's office in a $5 million facility on a helicopter? Obvious choice. Six years as a Chinook mechanic, learned way more than I ever thought I would know about helicopters. All right, enough of life advice from me for the day. Let's get this cap off here and see how corroded our points are. As is tradition, they look a little corroded, so let's get some sandpaper and clean them up. All right, you're gonna wanna make sure that either your battery is unplugged or your key is off, or you will immediately insert yourself into that V equals IR equation as a component of I. Next thing you know, you will feel the math coursing through your body. And unfortunately, you're probably not gonna come out like one of those people that get hit by lightning and learn how to play the piano. You're probably just gonna yell and hit your head on the hood. So, make sure the key's off. I'm gonna sand these up nice. Try to get my finger in between them and wipe off the dust, if possible, or a little piece of cloth if your shirt reaches. Now we're gonna unplug our coil wire, the center one in the cap, and check for spark. Well, we got spark when I do that, so in theory, that should be working. Let's go ahead and put our rotor back on, which I always forget. Put our cap back on, and see if it makes a little noise. Come on, girl. Make some noise for me. There we go. Ooh. Rust falling everywhere. I love it. <laughs> it's running rough, so we either got some sticky valves, or she's just choking on the wrong quantitative amount of fuel, or some spark plugs are rusty, or rings are stuck. It, it's pretty normal, and it likely will clear up here in a little bit. So I'm gonna try to fill this bowl again, and then I'll get in and run the gas this time and see what happens. Hell yeah, that thing lit right off. <laughs> Burned through all the fuel in the bowl and revved and everything. I even had the oil light go off right away and then about three or four seconds after I sh or it shut down, the oil light came back on. So that means we had enough pressure for it to take a while to bleed back, which means we have good oil pressure. Let's keep moving forward. At this point, I need to disconnect the fuel line and make sure we are not pumping the gabagoo into the carburetor from whatever might be in the tank. All right, I filled our bowls all the way up. We got a nice classic leak from the bottom of the carburetor base. They all do that, I don't know why. Our fuel line's disconnected, as you can see. So we're gonna see if anything comes out of that. Oh, come on, old girl. out of the tank. That's good, I guess. 
I guess at this point, I go get some gas, put a couple gallons in the tank, and see if something does come out. Let it flush out for a little bit. That requires a run to town, so let's get a gas can and a eagle and make it happen. Boop. Yeah, not much has changed here. I did have an oil light come on the very next day after the video, so I put a manual gauge on. Turns out it was a bad sensor. And then the very next day after that, I had a battery light come on just because the alternator went bad, so. It's been that classic old car that needs a couple things, but beyond that, some bitch is getting like 18 miles a gallon and doing great. I love it. Let's go get some fuel. I can only imagine what kind of sadness is in this tank since it's been sitting open for a long time. But uh, it did have a car cover over it for the whole time, so we'll find out, that's for sure. Okay, that should probably be enough to get picked up and brought to the pump. Let's see if it do. There's a little bit of gas in the cab. I wonder if the tank leaks. from our pump. I think she is kaput. That's alright. I've got a boat tank and a uh, electric fuel pump here. Let me go grab it and we'll be good to go. Okay, as another train goes by, we have set up our fuel system. We now have a line that runs into the carb, hooked up to our soft line, which runs through the rust holes in the cab, into the cab, up to the floor, across all where my feet are supposed to go and then into our boat tank. Got it grounded out to uh, some bolt that was on the trailer brake controller. Ooh, which works! Sweet! And then the positive is just shoved into a fuse over here that activates off the key. So as you can see, we've got fuel moving. Oh, actually now we really do have fuel moving. Let's see if our uh, needle and seat hold. Wait for the gas volcano. There it is, shit. It's not working. <laughs> Our needle and seat do not hold. Be better. Let's see if that does it. All right, that fixed it. Let's see how she runs. It's gonna be flooded to hell. I gotta give it some, some gas here, get some air in there. seeing if we can make it stop. All right, time for some antifreeze. I already dumped in the concentrate. This is just water to help offset it now. Usually we just use straight water throughout the summer because it's, you know, antifreeze is expensive and I don't like dumping 15 bucks into something just to see that I'm going to drop the radiator or thermostat or it's going to leak right out the bottom. But I've kind of come to the realization of, well, I did a bunch of revivals this summer that, you know, we're not buying anymore. And now I've had to go back and find all those and put antifreeze in them. 
because I don't want other people's cars to freeze throughout the winter. So I think uh, moving forward, I am going to be mixing in antifreeze and making sure with the tester ordeal that we're at the right temperatures. So fun stuff. At this point, I need to make a trip to the shop and pick up that other master cylinder I have and get that sucker on there. I guess we can see if this thing comes up the temp in the meantime. I'm sure that thermostat is stuck. That's going to take some real heat or smacking it to get it to open. The fuel pump started working. Not properly, but kind of working. Alright, fuel pump's hooked back up. Let's see if that uh, moves the appropriate amount of fuel. I kind of doubt it, but we'll see. Probably enough to idle for sure. As you can see, there's a filter right there, and it looks like the base of it is unhappy with life. Let's see what's up. Ooh, that is not good looking fuel. It's like black. <laughs> yep, that o ring let loose. Yummy. You know what? Since that started working, it's probably a good idea to get this changed out anyway. Let's take a trip to O'Reilly's and get a new filter and I'll see if they just have a, a brake master in stock on there. They're like 25 bucks. Alrighty, we got our parts ordered up. They're going to be here at 4. Thank you O'Reilly Auto Parts and Ames. You guys kick ass. In the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and remove the old master cylinder. And somehow I'm going to magically do that without stripping out these fittings. Holy shit, I actually got it. That is incredible. For how rusty this truck is, I thought that would have been absolutely impossible. Two for two? Okay, no way. No way. <laughs> that never happens. Like, ever. I, this might be a first. Eh, that's more like it. Nothing. Holy shit. All right, sweet. I just got all three lines to come off without stripping anything or snapping any lines. So let's get that guy removed and go pick up our new parts. Okay, quick pause. I just realized I made a grave mistake. I have been calling this truck the wrong thing on two accounts. One, I just actually stopped and took a look at this grill. I've been literally flying around so fast that I just assumed this was a 70 and got it confused with the 70 that's identical and sitting over there. This is actually a 72. Those are plastic inserts in the grill. And problem number two, I just looked at the VIN and when I was taking the master off, I caught sight of that tag and that is not a 300. That's actually a 240. That's even smaller than a 300. It's what the 300 is based off of. 3.8 liters smaller brother of the 300. So yeah, my apologies. This is a 72 F100. And that's a 240. All right, moving on. Let's get this the rest of the way off. Alrighty, we got our new parts, new filter, new master cylinder. Uh, before I put this one on, I'm actually gonna run the old one a little longer. I rinsed it out a little bit with some gas and took a bunch of gas and rinsed out that basin. That basin probably had a half inch. No, it had, look at it now, three quarter to an inch. It was pretty much level all the way across of a uh, rust powder in the bottom. It was disgusting, so. We are going to expect more of that to come out. It's probably why it was not pulling fuel. It was so rusty. So, um, yeah, we're going to let that old filter that has been rinsed off eat up most of that again. Do this a few times, and once we see it coming out a little bit better, we'll go ahead and put the nice new Wix filter in. So, most importantly, though, we got a new O-ring, so that should stop the leak, and things should be happy. Woohoo! Dies right off, and then promptly dies as if it's getting no fuel. The part's less good. 
Yeah. Oh yeah, look at that, just nasty. Come on girl, prime up. bit more in the bowls see if she'll sit here and idle we're losing light pretty quick so I'm not gonna not gonna screw with this too much I gotta get those brakes on there I imagine this would be a two-day thing at this pace it'll take a second to run out of what's in the bowl oh you bastard come on are you getting fuel or not okay well ironically there's Plenty of pressure back here, as you can see it wants to spray out, and there it goes. So our pump is working, like hands down. Now I'm going to be looking at a needle and float that is not correctly operational, so. Oh, I just heard it let loose and went bleh. Let's try this again. This is once again why you don't run the old fuel tank, but I don't have time. And it's a 300, it's fine, it'll, it'll freaking love it. And now it's done. <laughs> well, we definitely have some unhappy elements to the fuel system. All thanks to that rust in the tank. So, uh, Let's go ahead and get our master in here and get all that sorted out. And we might have to pop that top of that carb off, clean everything out, and rig up an alternate fuel source after all. As much as I would like this to be a standalone truck where you put a battery in it and go, it might just not happen. Alrighty, our shiny new master cylinder is bolted in place. It's time to fill that up, go steal Mook from whatever she's up to right now, and get that bled. At which point I will immediately realize that something in the back lines are blown or all of the wheel cylinders are froze and that was completely not worth my time but uh we'll get to that when we get to that let's get it done because we're losing light all right so we got our blood definitely have a blown line in the rear so i went and put that uh cap on because ain't nobody got time for that and mook says we got some pedal fuel <laughs> yeah. let's see what we can do about fixing this fuel system and then see if we got some brakes Okay, so I hopped in. Uh, we were feeling the wrong thing. Turns out we have no brake feel whatsoever. Our pedal is flat. Um, I'm like, oh, okay, no problem. Crawl underneath to bleed the front brakes. And if you guys have ever owned or worked on one of these, you know, before I do, apparently, that that is pretty much physically impossible on these trucks. There's a huge bracket that completely encapsulates the bleeder to where you have to probably have some special bullshit tool I don't have or take half of the brakes to include the hard and soft lines off to get to the bleed screw, at which point I immediately will probably rupture the harder soft lines. So, in other words, it ain't happening, and I just spent $83 for absolutely no reason on that master, which I'll take off and put on the shelf. So, we'll use it on a different one, but uh, I spent two hours for no reason. We're going to pop the top of this carburetor off. So anyway, this piece of shit doesn't want to accept fuel anymore because looking at the fuel coming out of this, it's not bad. It's actually cleaned up pretty well. Uh, get this needle and seat working and try to drive this up and down the road once before the sun goes down in about eight minutes. Woohoo! Why does it always come down to this for me? Okay, uh, got our electric pump hooked back up. There's another goddamn train. No brakes. Uh, for whatever reason, when I turn the pump on, I get fuel absolutely just running like a river down here. So, I don't know what that's about. I'm sure that'll go away, right? I popped our carburetor top off, cleaned off our needle and seat. Uh, like I mentioned, we've disconnected the tank and the pump, so that should not be a problem anymore. We're running back off of clear, clean fuel. So, 
Trying to run the pump was a bad idea. Who knew? It sat for years without a uh, cap. It'd be a problem. Crazy. All right, cop the wife, you pile of crap. <laughs> myself in the truck that is a potential fire hazard and now we go for a drive. engine brake. I the like the master cylinder started working or something happened to where I suddenly got brake pressure. So I tried to use it and I think I blew all the front lines out. It was just like <laughs> and I was like time to stop and I pressed and just went boom and there was nothing. This Wait. thing's a pilot you <laughs> like no offense to the guy who had it. he he got his money out of it 107,000 miles on an original drive line. The clutch chatters, the whole thing squeaks, it's rusted the hell, the brakes are all seized. But it's a it's a Ford, 240. That means it runs. So yeah, at this point we toss this thing on marketplace and get it out of my yard because we're moving, like I mentioned. So I'm sorry this one was such an abrupt episode, with such an abrupt ending, but. We do get a drive off into the sunset at the end of it. So if you guys enjoyed this, stick around. It's going to be a rough little month and a half here. I'll try to get you guys some good content when we have. But once that's through and we get through the move, there should be some great things coming. YouTube is what Mook and I do for a living. So sometimes it can be hard to balance the weekly content creation with life. So if you like to support us in our cause of staying alive, consider liking and subscribing and commenting on this video. Long story short, we will see you guys right here next week for hopefully a little better episode of Junkyard Digs. Now if you excuse me, I've got a sunset to drive off into. Back into the pit it goes.